All right, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. If I can make this thing work. There we go. Okay, so just as an aside, when uh, John Naden wrote me and asked me to come and speak at the Furmore meeting, it occurred to me that I've heard of this fellow Furmore. But it turns out it was the son of Furmore who I've heard of, because um, I share a love of the island of Crete with a good friend of mine named Hugh O'Neill, and Hugh's been telling me stories over the years about this fellow Furmore who worked for the Greek uh, resistance on Crete and in fact kidnapped the general in charge, the German general in charge of Crete and, and whisked him away. And he's a bit of a sort of a James Bond kind of fellow and I've always sort of admired him and I thought, well, why would you have a geological conference and for this guy, as great as he is? And then I had to go on Wikipedia and realize it was his dad who was a geologist. <laughs> so here we are. Okay, so anyway, I'm just going to ramble on about sulfur for a while until they tell me I have to stop. And I've been working on sulfur for too many years. Um, I like to say that when I started working on sulfur, I didn't have any gray hair at all. And here I am. So my apologies if I ramble on a bit about it. But I'm going to do it in terms of porphyries. And one of my former bosses, who's also a friend of mine, Mark Harrison, said to me when I was telling him I wanted to work on porphyries, he said, weren't they all figured out in the 70s? And yes and no. So first of all, I want to say that um, I did my PhD in the U.S. with a, a fellow who was from Penn State who was part of the crowd that was doing this sort of view. And his supervisor was Wayne Burnham, who came up with this model. And you can see it's Burnham 79. And the concept here is that, and, and this, was, this was a great concept. It was a big step forward in our understanding of what happens. The idea is there's a, an intrusion and it has all these little bubbles on the top because we have a water-saturated carapace. The water exolves, fractures above it up here, and this makes a porphyry, and it's a one-shot deal, and we're all happy. So the question is, does that model still work? I suspect that there are some issues with it, and I'll go into those. But one of the other things that happened in the 70s was this, which is a model based on a couple of mines in Arizona, San Manuel Kalamazoo, two mines that were sitting next to each other, separated by a fault, and they put together a model of zoning here, which is, we all learn it if you take an ore deposit class, we all teach it until we're sort of sick and tired of teaching it, and we have a, an ore shell, and everybody's happy, it's all done. Again, it's a one-shot deal, it's one intrusion that goes through a procedure, it exolves the fluid, which does a few things and precipitates the ore, that's a story, let's move on to something else. So the question I want to ask is, do these models still really work? Obviously there's a lot of good things in them, but there's a few issues. And it's interesting that, that both John Blundy and others mentioned that the concept of we have a whole bunch, in fact John had some fancy way of calling it transcrustal, right, which is a nice buzzword. But what he's saying is, is the concept that I've been thinking about a lot, is that it isn't as simple as just an intrusion. It's a whole series of nested intrusions. And this is from Lickfold et al. on um, what they call North Parks. It's something that Jamie talked about the other day. It's not far from where I live. It's in New South Wales. And it's a whole bunch of intrusions. And these intrusions are rather quite complicated in that if you think about it, this whole transcrustal concept is that these continue way down here. And so it's a procedure from down, way down here, we have a hydrous basalt evolving and coming up here and saturating in various fluids along the way, so that it's quite complex to unravel exactly what's going on up here. So maybe it's not as simple as the Burnham model, and maybe there's some things to consider. So here's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna talk about the oxidation state of sulfur and what we sort of know about it, or at least what I've seen and what I think at the moment. It could change, but I'm just telling you what I think now. Um, I'm going to talk about the solubility of copper in fluids and some things that we've recently done. I'll say, hmm, this is interesting. Um, talk about sulfur coming up from great depths. In other words, John Blundy showed yesterday that there's a thought that we can exolve sulfur really deep in the crust. So that's something I want to address. And then talk about if if we have oxidized sulfur, that's the transporting agent, then we have this interesting problem of we're talking about a giant sulfide deposit, so we're going to have to reduce it. 
So I'll talk about a few scenarios here. Of course, magnetite, we all know and love magnetite. If we need to reduce something and we're in trouble, we can always chuck carbon in there. And then I'm going to talk about disproportionation. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And so I'll go through it bit by bit until my light turns to orange and then I'll stop. All right. So oxidation state evolves. This is something that is of great interest to us because if you ask one of your friends that's an expert on arc magmas, why is it that arc magmas are oxidized? They'll sort of mutter for a while and then change the subject. We don't really know. But what I think is interesting is this. If I can point this the right way. Now, this is stuff that uh, Franny did with us at ANU before she left ANU. And it's a neat concept that Franny, being the obsessive girl that she is, analyzed about two million morb samples, more than any of the rest of us would ever conceive of analyzing. But if you know Fran, that's, that's sort of Fran. This is the cloud of morb. And when we worked on the Manus Basin, uh, specifically the Pool Ridge that this paper is dealing with, is we found that there is this amazing increase of copper from something less than 100, maybe 30-ish, up to 300. And it's during this process that we imagined that we start with just normal sort of stuff in the wedge, and we are evolving to higher copper for sure. And, it, and it's almost mind-boggling to think that we can have a tenfold increase in copper. That's, that's a lot of fractionating. During this process, we imagine that what we're doing is building up the three plus iron until we saturate in magnetite. Then the magnetite we can see here, this is vanadium against magnesium. The magnetite crashes out, switching the sulfate to sulfide, <coughs> causing what we call the magnetite crisis. This is, this is maybe not a way to make an ore deposit, but I think what it's telling us is, and this is my interpretation at least, is that we are evolving to higher redox state. So the concept would be that maybe down here we were looking at sulfide, and maybe up here for a moment we were looking at mostly sulfate, and then we switch back to sulfide. So it's a back and forth kind of concept here. So this was the Puol Ridge, and this is sort of the poster child for the magnetite crisis. Now I have a student, Matt Valatich, who's been working on bononite melt inclusions. So we went to the Bonin Islands, the Chichijima and Mukajima, and got a whole bunch of grains of spinels and other minerals, and they're full of melt inclusions. It's actually an extraordinary collection. What we found was that the copper starts out really low. And so we're up at very high magnesium. As you know, bononites are quite magnesium rich. Up here, we have very little copper, so we have to evolve way past the point at which this saturated all the way down to some ridiculously low magnesium number before we reach what we consider to be a very late magnetite crisis. That's kind of interesting for a few points. Uh, one is that the source of the bononites really is quite desperate. There's not much left in it. Not much sulfur, not much copper. In fact, if you look at the melt inclusions down here, it's hard to even measure sulfur at so low. So we nearly need to evolve up, and notice how copper doesn't get anywhere near the 300, it gets to 120, which is rather pathetic. But as we've seen before, that's probably enough copper to do what we want to do. So we get this crash, and this crash has always been questioned. Wee Dong Sun said that he thought it was an exolved fluid at that point. We've had discussions over the last few days that maybe rather than magnetite here, maybe what we're doing is exolving sulfur. That's reducing the magma because it goes off as SO2, and that will trigger Sulfide saturation, maybe. OK, so there's something I want to show you about this that I think is quite interesting. That if you look down here, where we go back to really low copper, most of the melt inclusions are just glassy, and we can measure low copper on, on the laser. But a few of them, and this is, I, I'm quite impressed, because this is the first time we've actually seen magnetite in a magnetite crisis. When we did this one here, we just made it up. We not only didn't have sulfide, we didn't have magnetite. So we used to say it's fictive magnetite. Just trust me, it's there somewhere, right? But the reality is that in this melt inclusion here, which isn't, isn't terribly big, this is 20, 20 microns, you can see it's a melt inclusion full of all these beautiful magnetite crystals, and interspersed around it is a whole bunch of chalcopyrite. So this one was just lucky enough to trap it in the melt inclusion, 
So we actually have a magnetite crisis with magnetite this time. So my point is that the one version that we published on the Manus Basin is just one possible path through this. Franny has other papers where she's shown other versions, depending on redox, it's a different path. This is another one with bononites that gets to the same place eventually. So the concept that we have evolving redox is one that I'm going to make as a premise. I may be wrong, but I think that's maybe defensible. OK. So this is sort of a famous diagram. I spent a lot of time years ago working on this, which is the sulfide capacity as a function of redox. So if we get reduced enough and we keep pressure, temperature, and FeO content constant, we see that there is no real change in the capacity to carry sulfur. This is quite well established. It does vary considerably with pressure, but this is constant everything. There is a sort of a step function somewhere around this magic point, right? There's something magic about arcs. We always find ourselves here. One wonders why, just coincidentally or not. And then we have a step up in sulfur solubility into the sulfate field. This at constant water, pressure, temperature, CaO content is again flat, but it's really strongly dependent on calcium. So this is dependent on calcium, this is dependent on iron, and they're only flat at constant everything. But there is a huge step up, and one of the reasons we prefer to move sulfate in the melt as opposed to sulfide is this step up from some lousy 0.1 weight percent to something like one weight percent. That's a pretty big step up. So what we would like to do is transport this and then reduce it, and we're bound to be saturated. We can make a nice ore deposit, and everybody goes away happy. There are some problems. There always are, especially with sulfur. So my good friend Vlad, with the unpronounceable, unspellable last name, in fact, I had to check it because there's some extra J's and other letters in here that don't seem even necessary, so we'll just call him Vlad. Right? He did this stuff with, with John Blundy, and showed that there's this weird pressure effect. So what this is, is this is redox again, relative to NNO, which would be right here. And this is simply the boundary between sulfide to the reduced end and sulfate up here. We've all known it has to be the shape. It's eight electrons. You can make that shape up, but you don't know where it sits in space unless you do some experiments. We always knew it was somewhere in here, so this isn't that surprising. But what was surprising in his work was he had at high pressure, it's way up here, so that at high pressure, if we're in any of this region, we're going to have sulfide stable. And then at low pressure, it's going to march down and we're going to switch to sulfate. This is the opposite of what we want. This is the wrong answer, right? So we have to sort of live with this. Now, I think we need to confirm this is right, right? I'm not saying that Vlad's a liar. I think he has good evidence for this, but until we confirm it again, We'll have to be a little bit cautious with it. But this has some implications, and I'll get back to that in a minute. OK, so I have some, uh, John Blondie's not the only guy that has Russian friends. I have some Russian friends. One of them is my buddy, Dima Kamenetsky. And he and uh, Misha, this fella, go to this crazy, this crazy Tolbachik, which is, God knows where, it's in the Kuriles. It's, it's at the end of the earth. And they go there, and they collect all of this mess here. And one of the things about my, uh, my buddy Dima Kamenetsky is he's really good at finding melt inclusions. And so he and his mates will sift through millions of olivines in this arc basalt eruption and find the most extraordinary thing. These are olivines. And these things are full of big gobs of sulfide. I mean, look at it. It's more sulfide than olivine. You could pract I think you could probably mine this and do pretty well, right? So, this is a problem because these things are faux 90 olivines. So this is high temperature, high pressure, primitive. This is the holy grail. This is what we're starting with. And we've screwed the entire thing up by saturating in sulfide. And here you go. All right, party's over. Now what are we going to do? We're way too deep. We haven't exalted the fluid. We've messed it all up. If you look at these things, they are quite extraordinary that you have big gobs of amazing melt inclusions. The melt inclusions have sulfide bubbles in them. So they're full of plenty of water, plenty of sulfur, plenty of chlorine. They got everything we could ever want. In fact, I was wondering when John Blundy was speaking yesterday, 
if this is the sort of numbers, and I think it is sort of roughly what you were talking about, right? So they aren't just entirely made up, they come from this. But if this is sulfide, and it's a sulfide melt, and it's very dense, how are we going to get it out? This is a bit of an issue. But the point I want to make is if we absolve this stuff, we're mostly absolving reduced sulfur. That's a good thing, and I'll come back to that. Okay? Just a few more pictures of them. This is in transmitted light. This is reflected light. Look at all these big gobs of sulfide. And they're not just any old sulfides. They're, you know, what you want. They're ISS and MSS mixtures. Plenty of copper in here. All right. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the solubility of copper for a bit. Uh, years ago, I had a, a PhD student who uh, did a synthetic fluid inclusion study of copper chloride solubility. This is a beautiful picture of a whole bunch of fluid inclusions here. Notice how they all have the same size bubble relative to the size of the inclusion. And they all have the same copper chloride crystal relative to the size of the inclusion. What we found was that copper chloride is almost infinitely soluble. Chuck more salt in, you get more copper chloride, there's almost no limit to it. Percents of copper chloride, not a problem. Right? So this is actually quite interesting that if we think about is there a problem transporting copper as a chloride, the answer is no. However, recently, um, a former postdoc of mine who is currently a postdoc in Bristol, Mary Lavelle, We've been going for years to the ESRF in Grenoble and using what they call the FAME beamline, which has this amazing autoclave, which you put inside of this gadget here a, a little tube made out of either uh, carbon or they make these things out of corundum. And you have two little pistons so that you can have a solution inside here, put it inside this gadget, pressure it with gas, and do synchrotron through a fluid. It's really not that easy to do, but it's actually quite handy because it's bigger and better than a fluid inclusion. If any of you have tried to do fluid inclusions on a synchrotron, you didn't have a lot of fun. I can tell you that right now. I've spent too many hours trying to do it. This thing's much more fun. So what we found was we were just trying to play around with copper. And to cut this short is that we found that when we were just looking at copper chlorides, we were having much higher solubilities than if we put some sulfur in there. So unlike what... Brian said yesterday, I'm suggesting in these solutions, as we add sulfur to it, especially reduced sulfur, we don't get higher solubility, we get lower solubility. So I'm suggesting that ideally, we wouldn't have reduced sulfur in the fluid that's carrying the copper chloride. Just putting it out there as a concept. Right? This, I think, is rather attractive. One of the things we were trying to do was vary the density of the solution and see if something that's more fluid-like is much better at transporting than something that's more gas-like because we have a feeling that a lot of fluids that are exolved that go into making porphyries and epithermals have very low density. And it turns out that the, the low density phase can carry plenty of copper. So same old thing here that high density fluids carry a lot of copper, lower density plenty enough, right, with thousands of ppm. But as we add sulfur to it, we decrease it. Okay, so. This is the classic example from a student of Willie Jones. It's a nice piece of work. It's suggesting that, as Jamie suggested on the first day, that simply by cooling a solution with everything in it, we will reach a point where we will saturate in chocolate pyrite and it will precipitate out. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm just suggesting that's not the only pathway to hydrothermal deposition of chocolate pyrite. It's one of, I think, a few, and this is what we'll carry on with. Okay, so sulfur transported from deep. Now, I'm not going to talk about this too long because John spoke about this yesterday, but one of the things that I think is amazing is this. This is a slide I stole from Blundy. And the idea here is if you look at evolved arc magmas, they have plenty of chlorine. John spoke about this yesterday. And they have almost no sulfur. This is a problem if we're going to do the Wayne Burnham model. If we're going to have an evolved arc magma to relatively high levels in the crust, it's going to exolve a fluid that's going to make a porphyry, we better have some sulfur. If this is true, and this is mostly based on melt inclusions, then we do have a problem. I think we have to admit it. And we weren't the first to come up with it. This is from Hattori and Keith, you know, quite a few years ago, 16 years ago. And what they said is, this is sulfur against FeO content. 
Notice how, again, I said that the sulfide capacity is a function of FeO. If you want to carry a lot of sulfide, you're going to have to have a lot of FeO. And they show that here, primitive arc magnets can have a lot of sulfur, but evolved melts like Mount, Mount Pinatubo don't. So we weren't the first to suggest this. I would say to you that this might be a better melt to make a porphyry out of eventually than this, if we actually want to make a sulfide deposit. And I think most of you would agree. So if we look at this, they had a concept that is that here somewhere at depth, we're tapping off sulfur and other stuff, and that these things come up here and somehow make a deposit. It's not that different than the proposal that we put forward, except this is all the stuff we need coming out at great depths from a primitive oxidized arc basalt. Our concept was that we're getting sulfur, but maybe not the copper. I think the jury's still out on that, but let me just briefly review it, and I don't want to go on about it. Here's the paper here that came out. As John said, we, uh, we've had slight resistance to this concept, but it's a hypothesis that we're still trying to test. Um, what we did was we just took, the, uh, the idea here is that we took something with, with water and sulfur in it and react it with something with, with brine in it, and we found that, looky here, we made copper sulfides in the felsic melt. So this was what we call the porphyry in a capsule. It doesn't necessarily solve all of our problems. It just suggests that maybe we could have copper chloride in a solution in a felsic magma or above it, and then we could have some sulfur coming from the deeper part that could mix with it and precipitate. That's the idea. Okay. So this is something from a very different paper by Henley et al. Uh, two years ago, published in Nature Geoscience. And here they were talking about reacting SO2 with calcium bearing phases. And as part of this, former student of mine, Jeremy Weichs, ran models for uh, Gibbs free energy minimization under FO2 conditions of here, homogeneous gas, and what we are plotting here is the SO2 to H2S ratio. This is just the gases that people have measured in volcanoes that Jeremy modeled backwards to get down to depth. And then here we have different buffers, nickel-nickel oxide, rhenium-rhenium oxide, hematite-magnetite. This is probably ridiculously oxidized. We don't usually get there. There are some cases where there's hematite and porphyries, but I think they're relatively rare. But the way to read this diagram is, let's just look at this one, rhenium rhenium oxide. This is pressure in bars, and this is temperature. If we were to say at 800 degrees and let's say 800 bars, the ratio would be something like 5. We're between 1 and 10. The ratio of SO2 to H2S, there's 5 times as much SO2. If we lower the pressure, we find ourselves down here at, let's say, 200 bars. Now it's more like 20. So as we decompress, the ratio of SO2 to H2S increases. That's an interesting concept, that there's always some H2S and some SO2, but during decompression, we're making it more SO2 rich. This is a bit of an issue. And let me say why, right? Here's our usual magmatic gases, right? Here's the minerals we make. And so when we talk about oxidized versus reduced magmas, we have to think about what comes off of them is a function of the redox of the melt, right? The sulfur dependence, uh, the sulfur valence and ore reflect the redox conditions that, that made it. I'm suggesting if we have mostly SO2, we're going to have to reduce it to make an ore deposit. Okay, so I don't know if I need to go through here. For, let's, for, let's skip that, too many words. Okay, so the final part I wanna talk about is if we're going to carry, and I, I hope we mostly agree, that we're going to transport the bulk of the sulfur as oxidized sulfur, if we're going to do that, we've got a problem. We're going to have to reduce it at site. I hope we all agree on that. So I've got here some possibilities, and the first thing I want to talk about is magnetite and carbon. I've showed you the magnetite crisis. Because there's more 3 plus iron in it than 2 plus iron, precipitation of magnetite reduces the melt. That's fine for a melt. And so I stole this picture from Jamie Wilkinson's review, 2013 Nature Geoscience, and there's some interesting things implicit in this diagram. First of all, we're thinking about how we're going to make a porphyry deposit. We're in the shallow crust, and here, all of a sudden, we got magnetite crystallizing. Well, that might be a possible way. Let's have the magnetite crisis here. 
And then let's find a way to drag these little bubbles, little droplets of sulfide up, and get them up here to the porphyry. But let's say we didn't do that. All right, well now we're in trouble because we're gonna to have to reduce it somewhere else. So let's, let's chuck some carbon in, right? The problem here is again, we're gonna reduce it down here, we're gonna to have to get it up, so maybe having some graphite at site might be really handy. Bring the oxidized sulfur, bring the copper up, reduce it, copper sulfides, we're all happy. Okay, maybe. But again, we would have to have a lot of CO2 there, and we don't typically see a lot of CO2 in fluid inclusions from porphyry deposits. So I'm not sure this is happening, but it is a good potential idea. So I want to go then just to the last concept I want to do, is this idea of disproportionation. Big fancy word. The idea here is that we can take SO2 gas and we can react it with something to make sulfate plus reduce sulfur. So that's, that's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. So to do that, I want to go to the Grassberg, what's classified as the biggest copper gold porphyry in the world. It's on the high mountains up here, and this is, a, this is an old slide, so it's not actually in West Papua. West Papua is about here. This is West Papua. This is called Papua these days. So it's in the mountains of Papua. Amazing place. I've been there a couple of times. A friend of mine gave me this picture. This is Tambagapura. It's about 2,500 meters up. Out here you can see the Arafura Sea. Incidentally, what the company is doing is mining the crap out of this, grinding it all up, putting it in the river, and they're trying to fill the Arafura Sea up. And they're actually sort of winning, right? Someday, if we keep mining this deposit, we actually will fill the ocean up. But not yet. There's still an ocean there. If you go another 2,000 meters above this town, you found yourself up here, and here's the pit. The top of it's about 4,300 meters. Up around here, there's still a glacier, but there won't be for much longer. So if you want to go see it, I suggest you go now. But if you get to the top of the mine, it really is, it's, you know, it's like being up in the high Andes. You know you're up in the mountains. This thing is about four million years old, so it's a, it's a young deposit. And it's quite big, so this pit is quite a ways along it. And what's interesting is they've gone underground now, and the bottom of the mine is at about 2,600 meters, which means we have two kilometers by nearly a kilometer of continuous mineralization. It's ridiculously high grade. It's so high grade that when they pour the tailings down the river, there's so much extra gold going down that the people live on the river to try to extract gold from it because they only get like 90% recovery. Nonetheless, this is an amazing place. And if you go into the pit, you find that, again, we have nested intrusives, <laughs> multiple intrusives, so that the concept of us having one intrusion coming up, doing the thing, probably isn't going to cut it here. Okay, but the thing that was strangest for me when I went there, and I've been there a couple of times, and two years ago I went, and I'm in the pit, pointing at this rock, and if I was in near Tucson, Arizona, at Morency or something, I'd be saying, here's a fracture network that's full of quartz veins. You'd say, okay, that sounds like a porphyry. The thing is, if you take your hammer out and scratch these, they're soft, they're anhydrite. They're all anhydrite. Grassberg is a giant anhydrite deposit with a little bit of copper sulfide in it. If you look closely at the veins, you see that, oh, isn't that neat? Heaps of anhydrite, and then it's full of chalcopyrin and bornite. This is kind of weird. I'm really obsessed with this because we've got six plus sulfur sitting right next to two minus sulfur. How the hell would we do that? Why would we do that, all right? This, this troubles me quite a bit. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about that. It almost, as I say this, I have this sitting on my desk because I'm so fascinated by it. It looks almost like candy, right? The anhydrite's so clear, and sitting in it is all of this amazing sulfide. So the textures are quite extraordinary. One sample, here's bornite, here's anhydrite, and so you have these little flame things go of sulfide going into the anhydrite, and the anhydrite veining the sulfide. And I'm wondering if these things aren't co-genetic. In other words, we precipitated those two crazy different valences at the same time. How the hell would we do that? Good question. Okay, if you look at the fluid inclusions at Grassberg, and this is something we've just submitted for, for publication, there's a lot of really daughter mineral rich inclusions and crazy things like we think salt, we have glassy silicate in here, big hematites, Here's a vapor bubble, 
Here's chalcopyra, and guess what's in there with it? Anhydrite. Anhydrite in the fluid inclusions with sulfide, with silicate melt, with what we think might be molten salt. Gets curiouser and curiouser, doesn't it? Okay, so let's move on. My latest obsession, and it has been for over a year now, is the concept of using sulfur isotopes as a thermometer. And this is something from the 80s that was quite popular, the concept that if you measure coexisting sulfide and sulfate, you always find that the sulfate is much higher than the sulfide. And so this is plotting the delta 34 of both of them against the difference in delta 34 between them. So as we go to lower and lower temperatures, we finally get more and more different. That's just the way all stable isotopes are. At some imaginary super high temperature, they will all be the same. And when they did these diagrams, they thought that if we project these back, that will be the magic fluid we started from. I'm not so sure we still believe that, but it's a nice story anyway. So initially, probably two years ago, I went on the shrimp ion probe and measured some coexisting sulfate and sulfide and got some frighteningly high temperatures. And I showed this to some friends of mine that work on arc magmas, and uh, he said, look, these project to eight. That's a perfect arc magma. Just declare victory and leave, right? But it's not actually that simple. These are sort of the highest temperature coexisting phases that I found, but there are numerous ones that we find out here. So let me go into this a little bit more. Okay, I did go and find a PhD thesis done at the University of Arizona in Tucson by somebody named Gibbons, who did bulk analysis of sulfur isotopes from the Grassberg mine. And notice here is that we have the anhydrite. It's all about 10 to 12. And the sulfides are sort of like minus 2 to 3. At any rate, you can see that there's about maybe 11 per mil difference on average between the sulfide and the sulfate. With an extreme of, let's say, minus 2 to this, maybe 16. And 4 to 10 would be 6. So 6 to 14 as the delta. That gives us a temperature, and I'll come back to that, but let me first do this. So this is something that last I was visiting Bristol, we concocted to make a brew out of a gold capsule, a brine with some copper and iron chloride in it, some pieces of calcite because we wanted a calcium bearing phase. We want something that would react readily. We could have used calcium feldspar. We could have used Wallace tonight. We could have used anything, diopside, didn't matter. We just chose calcite because we found a piece and smashed it up and chucked it in there with our favorite sodium metabisulfide, which at some temperature makes SO2, which comes up and reacts with the calcite. So there's copper and iron chloride in the brine. There's SO2 coming up and reacting. We ran this thing for a mere two hours at 600 degrees. And these sorts of reaction, calcium chloride plus SO2 plus some other junk, goes to anhydrite plus some CO2, and here we go, chalcopyrite. Nice story, isn't it? The idea is that we take this four plus sulfur, and we make six plus sulfur, and two minus sulfur. Reaction's balanced, everybody's happy. So here's the result. Here's the capsule. Here's the inner gold capsule. It's lost a lot of its SO2, so there's just a little bit of junk left over here. This stuff came up, reacted. The purple here is all calcite. Happy as Larry, hasn't been touched. The red is all anhydrite. All the little bits of calcite were turned completely into anhydrite. And if we zoom in on it here, we find in backscatter that we have calcite, these are all anhydrite, and this is chalcopyrite. And so we did these maps here that show you iron is, and the copper, and the highest sulfur is in this chalcopyrite. And then here we can see there's plenty of calcium in the calcite and calcium in the calcium sulfate, but there's also sulfur, but less than the sulfide. So we co-precipitated. In other words, we turned this, these little bits of stuff, into anhydrite, producing the reduced sulfur to make the chalcopyrite. Isn't that nifty? We're calling this disproportionation. It's just a big sounding word. It just means the sulfur is going into two different valences, and it all mass balances, and everybody's happy. OK. so. This is the thing I showed you before, the delta, the difference between the sulfide and the sulfate, and it turns out it's a neat thermometer. 
that if the difference between the two is, let's say, 30, then we're at 250 degrees. If the difference between them is 5, we're up at something 900 and something degrees. So it's a thermometer of sorts. So I went on the ion probe, and I measured the chocolate pyrite that I just showed you, and I measured the anhydrate that I just showed you, and I'm not kidding, I got 11 as the difference. Right. Now, I didn't know when we analyzed it that I wanted to get 11. I just got 11 and then put it on here and said, oh, holy cow, look at that, 600 degrees. So this was done in the 80s and the 70s where they calibrated this, the fractionation factors between the two, and I did one experiment and did it and found it's 600 degrees. So I have reason to think that maybe this works, that we have a thermometer in our hands, and that that means that at least in our case here, the sulfate and the sulfide, their sulfur was in equilibrium. That's rather interesting, at least to me, right? Okay, so I've been doing traverses on the shrimp, looking to see how this works. And it has been tricky, and we're not done with this. This is tentative data. We're going to run it again next week and see some. But here we have a chalcopyrite coexisting with a whole bunch of anhydrite. These numbers are the del 34S, and the error on them is 0.2 per mil. So they're pretty good analyses. We can't get it a lot lower than that. And so as we go around on the chalcopyrite, we find you know it's 5 to 7. I haven't checked carefully enough yet to really go across it and see if it's zoned or not. But what I found here in this case, and I'm showing you this one because it's one of the better cases so far in terms of showing what I want to show you, is that we have a sort of a number out here when we get away from the sulfide that's sort of 9. Okay, fair enough. All right, we expect it to be higher. But as we approach the sulfide, on this thing you get a hint that it's only 9.711. Hmm. If we were having a mixed analysis of the sulfide and sulfate, we might expect this number to get smaller as we get there. But notice on the other side here, back around here is 9-ish, and then as we approach, we go up to 12. Hmm, right? Need to do more work. But the thought is that maybe this sort of 6 and 9 is telling us the temperature they co-precipitated at, and that this is some kind of re-equilibration back reaction as it cooled, which means if we do enough of this detailed work, we can get the real number and ignore this number, except that maybe this is telling us how long it stayed at temperature. In other words, it didn't just cool, it's a porphyry. It's two kilometers deep. It's going to stay hot for a while. Okay, so this is stuff that I'm working on, but think about it if we go back to my diagram here and we say, okay, it's 15. So we've got them co-precipitating at 450 degrees. As I said to you, I've got other evidence up to about 700. So it's over this range that we're precipitating those veins. I think that's fairly reasonable. However, if we go back to the Willie Jones argument that we simply precipitate chalcopyrite by cooling of a copper, sulfur, chlorine bearing fluid until we saturate, they're thinking 350, 400, so I think we're thinking higher temperatures. And a different process. I would suggest that this process is independent of temperature. We can do it at any temperature, right? And I'm still doing the experiments to go through and do these up at 800 and 700 and 500 and 400, go through all the nitty gritty of showing next year somebody a plot where I could say we've got points all over this and it's all hunky-dory and everybody's happy. Right, okay, so back to this. I said at the beginning that I'm most unhappy with this diagram because I want to transport sulfate and then let the pressure effect switch us to sulfide and we make the deposit in the shallow crusts and we all go home happy. Um, but now I'm thinking about it more is thinking that if we're going to be at, let's say, some super high pressure such that we're in the sulfide field, maybe that's okay. Maybe there's cases where we could bring that sulfide up and we can have a significant amount of H2S there, but as we decompress, if this thing's moving here, then we're going to find ourselves in the sulfate field and then we're going to need to reduce it. So maybe it's not an either or, maybe there's always sulfate and sulfide there, it's just a question of the relative amounts. And if we have too much SO2, we're not going to make enough chalcopyrite because 
there's not going to be much H2S. So maybe it's a compromise here, a mixture of processes. The H2S that's there can do whatever it's going to do. But if we have too much SO2, we can reduce it at site by reaction with the wall rock and cause precipitation right next to it. OK. So, so I'm thinking that we have magmatic gases coming off. We have what we've called a scrubber. In other words, a way to scrub SO2 out of stuff. It's kind of a neat word because we found that if you have too much SO2 pollution coming out of your smokestack, you take some limestone and put it up in the chimney and make anhydride. So we were really kind of stupid not to think of this a long time ago. The industrial people thought of it years ago. It's a scrubber, right? We can co-precipitate these things at any temperature. That's rather handy. We don't have to cool it all down. We can just have a reaction that does it. Right? So is this the reaction that's putting us always near that NNO plus 1, NNO plus 2 in porphyry deposits? Is it the sulfur that's controlling it? I showed you, we used to say, well, of course sulfur's not controlling it because there's so much more iron around. It's the iron 2-3 ratio. But if you go to Grassberg, you say, I don't know. This thing's more sulfur than anything else. So is this the buffer that controls redox in porphyries? Is this what's running the shop? It's sort of the, do the tail wagging the dog, but maybe that's what it is, right? So involve I'm suggesting evolved intrusives alone can't do it. We need to do some mixing. We can have temperature, really high temperature gases that can do the job. SO2 is very high, highly soluble, and copper is soluble, more soluble without sulfur present. I think that's where, I'm gonna stop because my light has turned orange. And the man up there told me when it's orange, I should stop and ask if there's any questions. Thank you. Right. Are there any questions for John? Um, oh, microphone. Bob. I was quite discomforted by John's idea of a. Bob. Bob. You need to use the microphone, Bob. Oh. <laughs> Um, most, if not all, pop, pop, porphyry copper ore forming magmas are adakites by the shape of the river patterns, <laughs> and so forth. The adakites on Adak Island bring up peridotite xenoliths. The adakites at Shivaluch Volcano bring up peridotite xenoliths. The adakites at Pinatubo bring up peridotite xenoliths. They've reached the adakitic stage of differentiation in a magma chamber at the Moho, or just beneath in the uppermost mantle. During long storage and the, <coughs> so I'm wondering if it's not feasible to have a replenished magma chamber and to actually inject your sulfur, uh, not as a add-on after the dacitic magma has already arrived in the upper crust, but to do it during replenishment of the Moho level chamber and then let the gasified felsic magma that was floating at the top of the Moho level chamber be f as it was being replenished come up as a felsic magma with SO2 gas bubbles or H2S gas bubbles in it so that they arrive at the surface in tandem as one mineralizing intrusion yeah. <laughs> instead of doing it by piecemeal add-ons. Yeah. Uh, so now you've solved the problem for us that our melt inclusions aren't giving us the correct number of sulfur because we're not trapping the gas bubbles. Yeah. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, a sh it's, it's possible. It would be hard to test, I see, I'd suggest. But we don't know if we haven't, I think the jury's still out, and if we're going to do a one fluid or two. Right? I think we would admit that. How can we tell the two scenarios apart? Your 
uh, magic brew with everything and the sulfur and stuff in the bubbles, those bubbles don't leave a record. So I like your suggestion the other day that maybe we could look at shielded appetites, for instance, within other minerals to see if there's a history of sulfur throughout. That's a good idea. We need a sulfurometer, right? Yeah. Any yeah, that was great, John. Um, I was interested in your comment about the effect of sulfur on copper solubility and sort of the, obviously the sort of bit of a contradiction with what Brian showed. And I did notice on your plot that you actually, the data was quite low temperature, 325, I think it was. And if you're adding reduced sulfur at low temperatures, that's, and, and you're inhibiting copper transport, that's kind of what you want, that's the depositional mechanism. So I was wondering how much of that difference is because you, those data are relatively low temperature relative to a, a higher temperature, maybe higher pressure environment where maybe the sulfur has the opposite effect. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't really speak, except that when we did, just for fun, when we were doing the copper chlorides at high cylinders, at high temperatures in synthetic fluid inclusions, when we did put some sulfur in there, we did find a drop in solubility. I, I can't say that it's exhaustive. I think we need to do more on it. Uh, there's always been some sort of folklore of some sulfur chlorine complexes of copper. I haven't seen a lot of evidence of it. but. It's really hard to do those synchrotron experiments at 700 degrees. Everything gets messy. Right? So I can't rule it out. It's a possibility. The other point I was just going to make as a comment is we've done a lot of work on the geology at El Teniente, and there's huge amounts of anhydrite right there. And what we've shown from carefully looking at the paragenesis is that the main sulfide depositional event starts at about the time when the major anhydrite depositional event starts. And the anhydrite veins there can be, you just have veins that are pure anhydrite, the biotite halo, and then you start to get the sulfide. And you get a lot of breccia development, hyd magmatic hydrothermal breccias at the same time as this major anhydrite precipitation. So there's, I think there's a, some messages in the geology there that we don't completely understand, but it'd be good to kind of well, talk I, about these ideas. Well, I was admiring your picture the other night of a plagioclase. <laughs> Anhydrite <laughs> biotite vein that I I wouldn't mind having a look at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, are there any more questions? Okay. Well, I, uh, one quick one, then we should move on. What is uh, is there any role for anhydrite uh, at the magmatic scale? So some places like Pinatubo have. Um, anhydrite phenocrysts. Does that tell us anything about the magmatic transport of the sulfur in those systems? Are they, are they particularly sulfur rich or more oxidized? And, and how does that link to like porphyry fertility? Well, you know, if, if Vlad's story of decompression moving over is correct, then we would expect anhydrite phenocrysts in most of these magmas, wouldn't we? So it, it's not exceptional. Anhydrite is a strange beast because it melts at a really high temperature. So we don't seem to see lots of evidence of anhydrite melts. What we see is, like plagioclase, we see cumulate crystals of it. And I don't think we should be surprised by that. I think if we looked harder, you know, one of the problems we have is that if you polish with, excuse me, if you polish with water, you wash away all the anhydrite. So I think we've been under representing anhydrite in general. We've had a bias against it because we like to clean our samples with water. I think it's everywhere. Okay, thanks John again. Yeah.